Welcome to the Infertility Podcast. I'm Candice. And I'm Daniel. Grab a biscuit because we've got the tea on all things infertility. If you're enjoying the podcast, please give us a five-star rating and leave us a review. This helps others find our podcast and get even more information about coping with infertility. Also, if you'd like to stay up to date with our story, you can follow me on Instagram at Operation Baby Bump. Have a great topic for our podcast? Email us at thevanwades at gmail.com. Hey guys, how are you? How, how are you? Hello. I'm asking them like they can respond. Oh well. Wink once if you're good, twice <laughs> if you're not. Honk once if you're in the car. Yeah. <laughs> Um, man, I'm still tired from this weekend. I'm very tired. We, um, jaunted up to Charlotte, which is about three hours away from where we live in Charleston. It's a great city. It was great. We had so much fun. We ate um, food with our mouths <laughs> and our hands and both. We, yeah, I have talked about Heather before. She is the person that referred us to Dr. Braverman. Um, she lives in Charlotte and we got to meet her IRL. She's wonderful. And she's amazing. We got to meet her little baby. She is a strong, real feminist. (laughs) I really enjoyed her. Yeah. She's a, she is an independent woman. She is a single mother by choice. She had, um, her baby Charlie cute baby so cute and i got to hold her like the whole time yeah um my i spoke to my mum today and she saw the picture that you posted and she was like that was a cute baby yeah Very she's cute really baby. cute daniel wouldn't hold her because he's scared of infants yeah and their I, heads <laughs> i don't trust like the fact that they can't hold their heads i just get really concerned and i'm clumsy i think with my own child i'll force myself to do it obviously but I am concerned about their neck. So, so I will he's be not doing... willing to practice on other people's kids, but he's willing to make mistakes with ours. I don't think that's, I will make mistakes. I'll great. watch a lot of YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. And You're going to watch YouTube videos on how, on how to, to hold, hold a, baby. a baby? Yes. Okay. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to... There'll be specialists. I'm not going to go to a comedy YouTube channel and say <laughs> how to hold a baby. <laughs> but I will find YouTube videos. Or I could just show you, because I'm a baby whisperer. I'm very good at babies. Yeah, you are. You're very good with babies. However, what if I bring something new to the table, like from uh, the videos? I don't know that you could bring anything new. Let the evolution of us being parents happen. <laughs> okay. Um, if you guys hear about a murder in, like, four months... Uh, it's possible that Daniel broke something I'm in not our gonna child. Break anything. They're so resilient. I was dropped on my face twice. <laughs> well, yeah, and it shows. <laughs> well, it does like physically with my nose. But... No, but your brain has suffered no, some. No, man, my yeah. That's fine. My brain's good. Our listeners are going, ah, oh, yeah. that's why. I would say that I am 50% capable of being a human like the other 50 percent is just luck okay not terribly great right uh so after we saw heather and her beautiful house don't even get me started on her beautiful house i will get you started because it is (laughs) by far my favorite house on planet earth daniel could not stop talking about her house when we left he was like and did you see this and Oh my gosh, did you see that? Did you see her clock? Did you see her countertops? It's gorgeous. And um, of course I saw her countertops. I think why, you know, this is going to sound a little silly, but she's a young lady living on her own and she has achieved so much. Yeah. And like that house and the location of that house on on a lake with a jetty and just beautiful. Mm-hmm. Everything about it, you were like, you're a grade A human. Yeah. And it was well just done. a little piece of heaven too. Oh, it's got so quiet. So quiet. 
Oh. So after we saw her, we uh, saw another couple of friends, and we went to Ikea. Yeah. Ikea, that's comfortable. Does anybody watch Friends? Okay. Mm-hmm. If you can DM me and tell me what I'm talking about, then I'll give you um, a high five. Pivot. That's all I have to give. And How many hours did spoiler we spend? alert, it was not in the same episode as the pivot. Oh, okay. How um, many hours did we, we spend? We were in IKEA for like four and a half hours. That was long. Four and a half. My back was in shambles, completely just about to collapse. My vertebrae were probably stacked on top of each other. Um, I mean, question wait a minute. Th- yeah, That's, they normally yeah, are. The- <laughs> there was no cushion between them. Yeah. What I meant was <laughs> they were probably about to collapse into each other. Like into one huge right, vertebrae. Right, into one huge bone. <laughs> I have a question for the listeners. Um, I say, like Candace just said, my back is a shambles, right? Is that what you said? I said in shambles. In shambles. And I would have said my back a is a shambles. Yeah. Um, I think you're right, but I'd love to know what everyone else thinks. Is it because I'm British, because we say it like yeah. that? Yeah, you've always said it that way, and I've yeah. always thought that was wrong, because it yeah. doesn't make sense. It doesn't, really. Shambles is plural, so it wouldn't be a shambles. I mean, it could be un shambles. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be like, my back is in is multiple shambles. <laughs> I have I several have... <laughs> shambles at the moment. And each of them is worse than the last. Oh, Lord. We should have said worser than the last. Worser. Oh, Lord. Y'all say a lot of things that are just, that just do not make sense. But so do we. Yeah, especially. I think everybody has their own little quirks. And it's all right. It's all Mm -hmm. good. My mom says, uh, favorite. Favorite. She Um, also says flat top. Flat top (laughs) instead of laptop. Um... You Love say, what? Well, so yours are especially... I don't say it anymore like that. You don't? I've changed my ways. Because of the because unceremonious I'm... mocking? No, because I'm more professional. I have a degree now. So er, I can't be saying... Oh, er, excuse me. I seem to have a degree. <laughs> oh, no, I won't drink my coffee without a teacup. I just thought I needed to probably start saying especially... I appreciate that. So that I was taken serious in the scientific community. Yeah. Good on you. Yeah. What else do you say? Do you say any other words? Not really. Yeah. Do I say anything stupid? All all the things you say are stupid. (laughs) All right, let me rephrase that. Is there any words that I say that are mispronounced or kind of like colloquisms or anything like that? Colloquisms. Colloquisms. I'm sure I could think of some. If you think of any during this podcast, bring them up. All right, I'll think about it. Let's get to the episode, shall we? Mm. This is part two about embryo transfers. Okay. Okay. And we're going to talk about embryo transfers. (laughs) The part two. (laughs) But the second part. Yeah. Uh, so I promised you guys that this episode we would talk about PGS, PGD testing. Um, I lied. Just kidding. I didn't lie. Oh, We're really going to talk about that. And PG tips. Oh, PG tips. That's tea if you didn't it's know. It's a tea bag. Okay, so first, PGS and PGD testing. What are they? What even are they? I'm sure you guys know this, but honestly... Some clinics will do one or the other. Sorry, guys. Some jackhole outside is playing music really loud. I can't hear. So if you can hear it in the background, I am sorry about that. Like really faintly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think if we keep talking, we'll be fine. Okay. So because of the fact that your clinic may not offer both or may not have explained what both are, Our clinic only offered PGS, and I never knew what PGD was until, of course, I started seeing it on Instagram and other people doing PGD. Is there a crossover between the two? You could do both. 
but you'd get the same results. Is that right? Is it? Do they pull the information the same way? That sounds crazy. Yeah. But... No, they do it the exact same way. So PGS is going to be, they call it pre-genetic screening. So PGS is pre-genetic screening. Um, the benefit to PGS is that it increases your chances of having a successful pregnancy. This is, you know, I'm, I'm all about citing my materials, but I will say that when I talk about things that I feel like are really common knowledge, I probably won't provide the sources for that. But if you ever have any questions or you are questioning where I get my information, please message me about it because I would be happy to provide that. I mean, you can Google it easy, you know. You can, but, I mean, I'm that kind of person who likes to provide the information. Yeah. We know that it's about 97% um, accurate, the screening, but it's important to understand the limitations of this type of testing. So I'm going to talk about that. An embryo consists of two parts. So when it gets to a blastocyst, it consists of two parts. The outer part, which is the trophectoderm, that is the outer cells that encase the inner cell mass. Um, the trophectoderm is going to become the placenta. And there's also an inner cell mass within the trophectoderm, and it's called the inner cell mass, <laughs> and it becomes the baby. Keeping it simple. Right, yes. They Would couldn't have been think nice. of anything... Yeah. To call that. Well, I would have just gone with the outer cell mass for the, <laughs> the other one. Uh, right. Maybe. True. Yeah. But they call it the trophectoderm. I'm assuming derm, outside skin yeah. type of thing. If I'm referring back to my origins of language here. Yeah, but, nice um, yeah, good, thanks. Good so an embryologist at your clinic is going to biopsy each of the embryos. They're going to take cells from each of the trophectoderms. Trophectoderm? Is that the plural? I don't know. But they're going to biopsy each of your embryos. So they're only taking outer cells. They're only taking those placental cells. And they send them off. And there are a couple of different companies that I know about that do these. We used um, CombiMatrix, which is... Now in Vitae, I believe. Oh, they changed their names? Well, it's the same company, but they have, I guess, two, two sections. They're going to actually test those cells. They do not gather cells from the inner cell mass because that could actually damage the embryo. Okay. And you don't want to do that. So, and actually, the process of biopsying the embryo could technically damage the embryo, but they're really skilled in, you know, just taking some out of the, of the outer cells. How incredible is that, that something that small, we can determine the depth in which we take a cell? Yeah. I mean, they can it's blow incredible. it up really big and see it yeah. and see all the cells. And, you know, of course they have all that equipment, so they're really good at just taking the outer cells and they don't stick the needle in too far. Can you imagine if instead of microscopes we used enlarger scopes <laughs> where if we wanted something big we just like okay make that a hundred times bigger and then we did and then we used like honey I shrunk the kids exactly like honey I shrunk the kids interesting yeah and then also honey I blew up the kids is actually right. what that would be mm -hmm. but on the reverse then you would use honey I shrunk the kid reversing ray interesting it's much easier you could or use like a spoon to we get could them. just use a microscope yeah sounds sounds good yeah. boring but so the cells are going to be tested so they're looking for chromosomal normalities or abnormalities mm -hmm. so are they normal are they abnormal the report will come back sometimes they come back as mosaics meaning that some of the cells were normal and some were abnormal. Um, there are a couple different types of mosaics and your clinic or your RE will actually advise you on, okay, this is 
this mosaic will probably have a chance. This one won't. Mm -hmm. And they determine that based on how many cells the actual embryo has. If if a um, embryo is mosaic, is there a chance that it could grow um, and be normal? Yes. Like... I have a friend, I have a couple of friends on Instagram who transferred a mosaic. They got pregnant with a healthy baby. So, and, and that's, that's the reason why I'm explaining this kind of in boring detail is because you have to understand what they're testing. They're testing the placental cell, cells. Sales. Sales. The sales. Hi, the placental oh, sales. The placental sales. Say. Sales. <laughs> um, so if the placental cells are normal, that doesn't necessarily mean the baby's going to be normal. And vice versa. If the placental cells are abnormal, the baby could be healthy. And the placenta may just have something wrong with it. Which is important because uh, the baby develops within the placenta. So if there's something wrong with the placenta, then the baby might not develop properly. So it's like when you order dinner and there's something wrong with it. And you're like, oh, I'm still going to live. I'm just, my dinner's wrong. Hmm. <laughs> I don't think this is the same, actually. I think I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> weird see you can definitely tell he was dropped on his head twice twice and fun fact he also got his head rolled up in a window once man i wish it was rolled it was electric <laughs> the window pushed up i remember i was poking my head out the window saying goodbye to a friend and my mum was closing the wrong window electric window so i was going <laughs> and then i could feel my jaw going <laughs> And mum being mum, <laughs> instead instead of lowering it, she was pressing it the wrong direction and continued to crush my skull. I mean, I was a teenager at the time, so... Oh, God, I wish I could have been there. <laughs> but the visual is just as satisfying. There's a dent in my jaw. <laughs> There's a dent in my jaw. I fully crushed my Gosh, skull. I love it. I love your mum. Yeah. Oh, God bless her. All right, so should you PGS test? Of course. Okay, well, that's your opinion. I hate to say this, but honestly, it's 100% something that you have to weigh out your pros and cons with your partner. Daniel and I had to really sit down and think about it. We actually, in, in all of the cases that if you're if you choose to do PGS testing, you will have to speak with a genetic counselor. That's just part of it. They're going to explain to you what I just explained to you, that the accuracy, uh, the, you know, they don't go into like the procedure part of it, but they will talk about how it's such and such percent accurate and there's no guarantee and the risks and the benefits, this, that, and the other. And then they'll answer any questions you may have about the genetic testing. So it's a counseling session. A little bit. Which I mean, goes in line it didn't really name. last long for me because I didn't have any questions. Who was, who was it? Who did we speak to? Was it on the phone with Combi Matrix? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I was part. Was I part? I was part of that. I yeah, remember. You were. Yeah. You were. And there are pros and cons yeah. to it. So one of the pros would be that if you had recurrent miscarriage, I personally had a couple of miscarriages before we started IVF, and that was my main reason for wanting to do the PGS testing because I was worried that those miscarriages could have been caused by chromosomal abnormalities. Mm-hmm. Because most miscarriages are caused by chromosomal abnormalities. So in the early stages of pregnancy, those early miscarriages, blastocysts may have formed, it may have implanted, but it didn't have all the chromosomes to survive. So that's why I did it. That's why, I mean, that's why we did it. That's why it was important for us to do it. If you have like egg or sperm quality issues, I think 
that might be something you want to look into mm-hmm. doing. Although I will say that if your bl- if your embryos don't make it to blastocyst, then that's kind of the indicator right there. If they do make it to blastocyst, that's a good sign. So again, just something to think about. I think there are also cons. Mm-hmm. It's freaking expensive. <laughs> what what isn't in, in this bloody journey? We, I think we ended up paying thirty five hundred dollars each time we did the PGS testing. We had to pay the embryologist to do the biopsy, which was seventeen hundred dollars, and then you have to pay the company that tests the cells, which was another how much ever. They like bloody robbery, isn't it? It was very expensive. Especially when you very. think that we didn't even freaking need it. And I'm not bitter. I know I sound bitter, but I'd love to punch our doctor in the stomach. <laughs> yeah, joking, so joking. all in all, I'm happy that we did it because our second and third round, we had nine embryos and four of them were severely abnormal. Not even like mosaic. They were just very abnormal. They were missing chromosomes they had duplicate chromosomes. It, it just was, they would not have resulted in a pregnancy. They may have resulted in a pregnancy and a live birth of a severely disabled child. Mm-hmm. But but mostly, we, I would have probably miscarried yeah, all of those. Yeah. So I am happy that we did it. You know, of course you can't regret spending the money, but... I'm happy we did that because now we have three healthy embryos left and we know they're normal, so there's no worry about it. Yeah, true, true. Another con, like I touched on, there is a risk that the embryo could be damaged, but again, it's not really something I was concerned about just because these labs and these clinics have highly skilled embryologists highly skilled and one thing I mean I will say probably the only thing I loved about our clinic was the embryology lab I mean it was the embryologists would call and they were very detailed Mm -hmm. about everything Mm -hmm. they're all doctors so they're they're very very careful and I um, you know there's always a human error yeah uh chance of human error but I trust them. I thought they were really great. So you just have to weigh the pros and cons, write them all down, see what's most important to you. And just, you have to make a decision, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, I I would always lean towards a yes on it, but I'm the sort of person who likes to increase our odds on things. And I, I appreciate that we're probably not going into the fact that some people maybe feel like it's crossing the line potentially. So from yeah, a, from a... I can definitely see where there's some controversy there. It's like, well, there's controversy with IVF yeah, while you're playing yeah. God, while you're taking the sperm and the egg, and yeah. you know maybe it's God's will. You don't, you can't mm-hmm. have kids, mm-hmm. and you know. Mm-hmm. But it's yeah, it's exactly that. Where's the line? What it keeps moving, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. So I wouldn't I get feel it. comfortable with doing. PGS testing to maybe say, well, we only want to have girls. Yeah. So I want to do PGS testing because we don't want to have boys. Yeah, get rid of my boy one. I think that is a little bit... Yeah, it is what it is. Crossing the line, maybe. I also, you know, they call that gender selection. I also think people who do IVF just to get a boy because they've already had three girls naturally. I don't think that's right either because you're creating a bunch of other embryos that you're never going to use. And then like, what if you throw them away? Yeah. That's where you donate them. I understand, but I just don't know if people would want their flesh and blood out there in this world. I think most people would probably I don't know. I think you and I, after the journey we've been through, um, and I know we're not the sort of people who have gone through to say, oh, I want a girl with blue eyes and brown hair or anything. We've not done that. Yeah, we've they done do it. that too now. Yeah, because we're desperate. But if someone really wanted our embryos 
and they'd been through absolutely everything, I'd struggled to say no to them. Yeah. Another little tiny pro, I wouldn't say it was tiny, is that when they biopsy the embryo, they poke a little hole in the zona pellucida, which is the outer shell of the embryo. Is that ICSI? Is that what that's called? No, ICSI is when they put the sperm into the egg. Oh, yeah, so they yeah, inject yeah. the sperm into the egg. The zona pellucida is like the outer shell. It's like a yeah. shell that protects the embryo. It protects all the cells from like expanding and like going off into space. But when they biopsy that trophectoderm, they insert a needle into the embryo. And at this point, it's got the zona pellucida around it. Well, now they've poked a hole in it. So then they biopsy, they freeze it. Once they rethaw that embryo, that zona pellucida, there's still a hole in it. It doesn't like heal or anything like that. So that zona pellucida has to hatch off mm -hmm. and come off of the embryo for it to successfully implant. Where I'm going with this is that once it's thawed, that hole that they poked for biopsy helps that embryo to hatch. So it's similar to assisted hatching, yeah. which I'll talk about later on at the very end. So that's another little pro, and that does help with implantation. Didn't help with any of mine, but yeah, boo. I'll move on. Okay, let's talk about PGD. What's the difference? So we know PGS is pregenetic screening. They're checking the chromosomes, seeing if they're all there in the right places. PGD is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis testing. Okay, that was a mouthful. It was. You did really well with that. That wasn't the first take, though, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> take seven day. <laughs> so PGD is very similar to PGS in that they biopsy it the same way. They send off the cells. They're still taking the um, trophectoderm cells. So they're biopsying it the exact same way. But they're screening those cells for genetic disorders, not for the chromosomes. They're looking for specific groups of things. Now, there are different batteries of the PGD testing. So some might look at cystic fibrosis, Down syndrome, sickle cell, things like that. Others may look at a different battery of genetic disorders. I don't really know. I did look this up, but it was hard to find that kind of information available in like lay terms without, you know, going and looking at all these different companies and seeing what they do. Kind of overwhelming and a lot of work for a podcast. And actually, I think you can choose what they look for. And this might actually be important to you if you had the karyotyping. And we talked about this in our episode about testing. Mm -hmm. They'll do blood work before you start IVF, and it's called a karyotype. Is and that on both of us? Yeah, it's yeah. on both of us. So if, if you did the karyotyping and you found out that maybe you are a carrier for, say, one of these... Uh, syndromes, maybe your husband is, or maybe you both yeah. are, this might be something that is important for you guys to do because then you can screen for which embryo might have those cells. And again, this might be controversial and it might be something that you don't feel comfortable with or believe in. But if you are interested in not passing along a disorder to your child and you can do something about that, mm -hmm. it's why, just why my wouldn't opinion, you want to do it? Yeah. I would want to spare them from something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, others may feel differently and that's fine too. I totally like understand that. Also, you may have a genetic disorder already and you want to be a mother, but you don't want keep passing that down to the generations and you just want it to end with you. Now let's move on to frozen and fresh transfers. I see a lot of frozen transfers on Instagram. I've seen some fresh transfers on Instagram and I've seen them both be successful. But 
Which is better? The short answer really is that frozen transfers are statistically more successful in resulting in a live birth than fresh. Is that because of the testing? So you don't have to do testing to do frozen or fresh. Right, well, in fact, in fresh transfers, you can't do testing because there's saying. no time. Is the success rate higher because they they eliminate more variables? So that is a good question. If people decide to do the testing and that's why they're having a frozen transfer, that could be a factor. But scientists really think that it's because the woman's body is further removed from the active egg collection, the hormones being all over the place, just the recovery factor might be in play there because the woman's body has now returned back to semi-normal. Revitalized. Yeah, revitalized. Also, frozen transfers, like you said, give you the opportunity to do the testing, so that might also contribute to the success. I also read somewhere that when an embryo is frozen and then thawed, the, th- the process of it being thawed helps to rejuvenate the embryo, like rejuvenate their metabolism. Hmm. And the metabolism is really important for implantation and survival in the womb because they have to have energy to burrow in and implant, first of all, and then like burrow into the uterine wall. Mm-hmm. I read this like a few years ago before we even started IVF, and I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. So that also might be a factor. I don't know if it really is, but it could be. I remember when we first started, no, it was before we had even started IVF, I had always assumed that fresh was better than frozen. Yeah, you would think because that's the natural way. That's the way our bodies do it anyways. And I think that in a normal, normal pregnancy, in a natural pregnancy, I would say, (laughs) I would say that the body is creating the exact hormones at the exact time it needs it. But when you do IVF, you're jacked up on estrogen (laughs) to make you have lots of eggs, of course. And so the estrogen levels are off. The progesterone levels might be off because your body might be producing progesterone. Yeah. But you're also supplementing it. So I I don't really know, but I do know that ultimately frozen is better. But again, I've seen a lot of fresh transfers work Mm -hmm. and go My friends have gone on to have really healthy babies and pregnancies. And I think it's just up to the clinic Mm-hmm. up to the RE and what their decision is for their patient because they'll know you, they'll know your body, they'll know how you're responding to the drugs. If you have OHSS, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, they're not going to want to do a fresh transfer because you've got too much fluid in your ovaries. Um, you know, your body's under a lot of stress, so they're not going to want to do it. So that could be a factor as to why they want to do a frozen transfer. Yeah. Now, I do have a friend who... No, you don't. You don't I have, have one. any friends. Yes, I do. I have one. I have a friend who did a fresh transfer. And her clinic freezes the embryos on day two. Isn't that wild? So I've never heard of that in before. A putri- what is it called? A Petri dish? Petri dish. I mean, but once, petri once dish. the embryo gets to day two... They freeze them then. They don't let them get to blast. So she had a fresh two-day transfer. That's so weird. Which to me, I'm like, how? How did you get enough progesterone? Because generally when you do a fresh transfer, they'll give you the six days of progesterone. So like while the embryos are developing, they'll start you on the progesterone and then put the embryo back in on like day six or day five. But no, she had a two-day transfer. It was crazy. But guess what? She got pregnant and has a really healthy baby girl. So it's all strange to me. I don't, I'm not an embryologist. I don't know. 
I'm not a reproductive endocrinologist. I don't know. I don't know who benefits from which one. So besides frozen, fresh, PGD, PGS, is there anything that actually helps a transfer be successful? And I know we talked last week about the old wives tales. I probably should have lumped these in with those, but these are more like scientific. These are more things that your clinic might do Mm -hmm. to help the success. The first one I want to talk about is embryo glue. You may or may not have heard of this, but embryo glue is an actual thing. Oh, so it's not like gorilla glue or something. No, it's, it's actually called that. Like the, the vial says embryo glue on it. (laughs) Yeah. But it really is what it sounds like. Um, And in order to tell you about what embryo glue is and how it works, I need to kind of get scientific for a second. And you know how I like to get scientific. Hey, wake me up when you're done. (laughs) I want to explain kind of the key mechanism of implantation for you guys to really appreciate what it is and kind of decide for yourself whether or not you think this is even helpful. Hyaluronin is a naturally occurring molecule that is found in the reproductive tract of the female. What is that? I'm sure you've heard of hyaluronic acid. Yes. Okay. Why have we heard of that? Because it's in all the beauty products today, right? It makes us younger. (laughs) It makes us look younger, youthful. Well, hyaluronin is hyaluronic acid. Get out of here. And so this molecule uh, was found to be really important in embryo implantation because of its functions, but also because it provides a high viscosity environment. What does that actually mean? That just means that it's like thick, a thick environment. And we know that's important, right? Because the uterine lining needs to be thick. So it helps to provide that environment. But some of its primary functions include movement and proliferation of cells, and it also participates in a number of cell surface receptor interactions. So it's helping to set up implantation in that way. So embryo glue is a unique combination of hyaluronin and human recombinant albumin. What on earth does that mean? (laughs) It is actually a synthetic serum that is supposed to be equivalent to the serum albumin in human blood. It is just a synthetic version. It's not from animals. It's not from humans. It's manufactured. Fake blood. It's not blood. It's just a serum that's present in the blood. So this embryo glue has that natural protein in it and also the synthetic protein. Now, the company Vitro Life, this is the company that makes embryo glue, they claim that this medium increases chances of embryo implantation resulting in pregnancy as well as live birth rates and also reduces miscarriage rates. Hmm. So this is their claim. I didn't read through all the papers that they cited. I'm actually going to post them on the Podbean website on this episode just because if you want to read more thoroughly, if you're interested in it, um, I didn't, but they actually did a meta-analysis of articles including more than 3,200 patients. And their data state that pregnancy rates increased from 42% to 50% when okay. embryo glue was used. Wow. And if you're a scientist and you have scientific training, you know this, but they cited their p-value as P was less than 0.00001, which is just really tacky. (laughs) Uh, What what does that mean? (laughs) Well, your data is significant if the p-value is less than 0.01 or 0.05, whichever. What does p-value mean, though? It's just the measure that they use Mm. to provide a level of significance. So 
it's either 0.05 or 0.01, 0.001 if you're super significant 0.001, but 0.00001, I don't know. I think it's a little bit tacky. This all sounds immensely boring. <laughs> okay, so does embryo glue help? You know, science aside, does it does it help, yes or no? The company thinks that it does, but to me, 42% to 50%, I didn't look at all of the papers that they used in their meta-analysis, so I didn't analyze their procedures and their methods. I don't know if all of these women are healthy, normal women. I don't know if they have unexplained infertility. I don't know if they have PCOS. I don't know if they had an issue and then embryo was embryo glue was used and then they got pregnant. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, there's always like, hidden variables. Right? right. So I don't know what they're comparing this to. I think if you're dealing with recurrent implantation failure like I had, I doubt it very much that this would be the one thing that gives you success, right? So do I think it helps? No, I don't think so. I think if you're a healthy woman doing IVF for the first time, do I think it hurts? Probably not. I mean, the stuff that they're using to compile this medium is already found in the body. So I don't think it would probably hurt. You could ask your RE about it. It's just something to think about. The other thing that is interesting to think about, will this help or will it not, is the scratch. The ouch. itch. Ouch. Ouch, ouch, ouch. I had an endo scratch uh, because we had tried everything. I think for our fifth embryo transfer, we tried the scratch because I told my doctor, look, I just, I, I keep hearing about this, like it's standard in some clinics. I don't know why. She said, look, it's not going to hurt anything. Yeah. So what they do is they take a catheter. They're going to stick it through the vagina. They're going to stick it through the cervix and up into the uterus. And we talked about the ERA and this is the exact same thing as an ERA, except for they're not biopsying tissue. They're just scraping the crap out of your lining. Giving you a good old scratch. <laughs> Giving you a good old scrape. And the idea behind this is to improve receptivity by kind of like irritating the lining so that it can heal. In healing, it like provides, you know, fresh cells and like it rebuilds. And so that's kind of the idea behind it. The best studies done on this show that there was not an increase in implantation with women who had the scratch done before transfer, but it really depends on the doctor and the clinic. So I don't know. My first doctor at my clinic was like, that's hogwash. And my second doctor was like, look, we'll do it. It's, it's not going to hurt anything. So we can just try it. Of course it didn't help anything either. So, uh, I don't know. It's a lot of pain for what it is. Can't hurt, though, if you really want to do it. If you've tried everything, I mean, these are just a couple little things that you might want to try. Or at least ask about or have more knowledge of. And then the last thing I talked about earlier, assisted hatching. Now, I talked about how the embryo has to break out of that shell in order to implant. I talked about how just the act of poking a hole in that zona pellucida to biopsy it kind of acts as assisted hatching, but the process of assisted hatching is when the embryologist will perforate that zona pellucida. So they may poke a couple holes, they may like take a chunk out of it. I found conflicting information, so I'm assuming there's more than one way to do this. But ask your RE, see what they think, and... You know, it's just, it's just good to know that these things are options, like other people are doing them and having success, so that you at least have way more information than you actually need, so that you feel really informed. And that's really all I have for you today, guys. That's all we've got. See ya. Thank you for listening.
I'm Candace. And I'm Daniel. And I. And I.